Some great sci-fi novels just don't have any luck when it comes to film adaptation. William Gibson's Neuromancer, Philip K. Dick's Ubik, Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama. I could go on. But there's one classic that predates them all, and for six decades and counting, it seems to have always remained the furthest from actually being filmed. Alfred Bester's 1956 masterpiece, The Star's My Destination. If you wanted to make a list of the most important and influential science fiction authors, Alfred Bester would probably deserve a spot at least in the top 10. His work was popular, critically acclaimed, and stylistically groundbreaking. Multiple generations of sci-fi authors have cited him as a creative inspiration, including Joe Haldeman, William Gibson, and Neil Gaiman. And yet, in spite of the immense respect bestowed upon him within his own field, Bester still doesn't appear to be very well known outside of science fiction fan circles. There are a few reasons for this. One is that his output was very sporadic. He didn't publish many novels within his lifetime, and the quality of his work proved inconsistent as he grew older. But the biggest contributing factor might be the fact that neither of his greatest books have ever been adapted into movies. Bester started his career as a pulp writer. He wrote short stories for science fiction magazines, scripts for episodic television and radio shows, and contributed storylines to Golden Age comics like Superman and Green Lantern. His first novel, The Demolished Man, published in 1953, became an instant classic, winning the first ever Hugo Award. The ingenious story followed a man who plots to kill a business competitor in a future society where telepathic abilities have made all crime a virtual impossibility. Bester's writing was flamboyant and gripping. He told his story with breathless energy and played with format to create unique effects. Instead of focusing on scientific plausibility, Bester's pulp sensibility emphasized idea, theme, and style. His work became a modern genre milestone. In 1956, he published Tiger, Tiger, later retitled The Star's My Destination, and his reputation amongst sci-fi fans was forever secured. Essentially a retelling of Alexander Dumas' The Count of Monte Cristo, the book was about an uneducated, unmotivated spaceship crewman named Gully Foyle, who was driven to embark on a violent and single-minded quest for vengeance after being marooned in space. Human teleportation, referred to as jaunting, has become the standard mode of travel, but it has limits. No one can jaunt more than a thousand miles, and jaunting through the vacuum of space is impossible. Reaching into his previously untapped potential for intelligence and ingenuity, Foyle survives, gets his face tattooed in a Maori style, and proceeds to carve a path of destruction across the galaxy, determined to wreak havoc on the people who abandoned him. His plans for revenge are complicated by an impending interplanetary war and a corporate conspiracy involving a new material called Pyre, so Foyle is forced to transform himself into a cunning and sophisticated member of high society. As he pushes himself further and further, he begins to unlock his true potential as a human being. Foyle begins the story as an amoral, thoughtless, and almost animalistic force of nature. Bester goes shockingly far in portraying Foyle's brutality, at one point having him rather gratuitously assault a woman. From these depths of depravity, Foyle gradually evolves into a moral being, conflicted about his own need for revenge. By the book's end, he is taking humanity's first step into a form of higher consciousness. The Star is My Destination, at the time of its publication, was not as lauded as The Demolished Man, but over the years it's become just as beloved. Bester's stylistic innovations are as astonishing today as they were in 1956. In perhaps the most memorable passage, he uses the formatting of the text itself to simulate the effects of synesthesia, a phenomenon where the body's senses become scrambled and start to swap places. After writing two of the genre's most influential books, Bester, incredibly, started to drift away from science fiction. He spent the better part of the next two decades writing travel pieces for magazines and scripts for television. In all that time, 
he published only a few science fiction short stories. He wouldn't write another novel until the early 70s. His later work was not met with the same acclaim. Failing eyesight and deteriorating health prevented him from ever making a full comeback. Bester's writing career basically came to a premature end in 1981, and he died six years later in 1987. There doesn't appear to have been many serious efforts to adapt The Star is My Destination within Bester's lifetime. John Carpenter famously worked on a potential adaptation for some time in the late 70s, but it's unclear how far it actually got. Carpenter did mention the book as his dream project in a tweet posted in 2011. Likely there were some other attempts, but if anybody else was pursuing the project in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, they didn't show up in any of the information I could find. The first significant attempt firmly on record appears to date from around 1988, the year after Bester's death. According to David Hughes's The Greatest Sci-Fi Movies Never Made, the rights to the novel somehow wound up in the possession of an unnamed individual described as a mysterious millionaire living in Hawaii. Whoever this mystery person was, his name apparently remains a secret. Stephen E. D'Souza, screenwriter of action hits like Commando, Die Hard, and The Running Man, was contacted by this person in the late 80s to script an adaptation. This whole area of the project's history is very weird and shady, so bear with me. D'Souza is extensively interviewed in Hughes's book, and almost all of this particular information comes from his recollections. Basically, he remembers a man wearing shorts and a Hawaiian shirt walking into his office at Warner Brothers one day and talking to him about the book. This man apparently wasn't a producer, he didn't appear to be involved in the film industry, and he wouldn't actually say what he did for a living. For whatever reason, he happened to own the rights to the book, and he wanted D'Souza to write a screenplay. D'Souza was a big fan of the book, so he decided to take this man up on his offer. Shortly afterward, things started to get a little confusing. D'Souza was informed that a screenplay already existed, apparently written by a friend of the Hawaiian Mystery Man. D'Souza read it and claimed it was extremely poor in quality. He says there were problems with structure, characterization, even grammar and singles out an Obi-Wan Kenobi-esque mentor character whose main function was apparently to provide all the story's exposition as a particularly clumsy addition. Later, D'Souza found out the script was allegedly written by the mystery man himself. As they negotiated what was now a rewrite of this existing screenplay, the two reached an impasse. The mystery man wanted final approval over the script, while D'Souza wanted the freedom to create his own interpretation. Understandably vexed by the whole situation, D'Souza never signed a contract, and the deal sort of fizzled out. A few years later, the project came back to him through producer Joel Silver. Silver had already produced several of D'Souza's scripts, including the massively successful Die Hard movies. He told the writer that Richard Gere, star of the recent hit Pretty Woman, was now controlling the property. D'Souza met with Gear and they discussed the project in detail, including how to best establish the mechanics of jaunting and other necessary bits of exposition involving the book's highly detailed world that were proving tricky to incorporate into the flow of a movie plotline. At the end of the meeting, Gear revealed that he wasn't actually the one who owned the rights. It was a guy from Hawaii. The same guy who'd met with D'Souza. The whole predicament basically turned into a higher stakes repeat of the previous encounter. This time there was a big name actor involved, a major producer, and a new screenplay that had been written sometime in the interim by an unknown writer. D'Souza claims that this screenplay was an improvement over the last one, but in his opinion, it was still in dire need of a comprehensive rewrite. Once again, the mystery man refused to allow any unapproved tinkering with the script, and the project fizzled out for a second time. Sometime in the mid-90s, the man from Hawaii appears to have passed away, or else simply lost ownership of the property. This is where events start to become a little more coherent. Bester's novel was able to take its first definitive steps towards a genuine production when the rights were purchased by German producer Bernd Eichinger. Eichinger was the head of Konstantin Films, a large European production company that specialized in expensive Hollywood-style movies like The NeverEnding Story and The Name of the Rose. 
The Star is My Destination, was likely going to be the biggest film the company had ever produced up to that point. It must have seemed like the time was growing ripe for this type of story. The 90s were proving to be a receptive and pioneering era for large-scale sci-fi. Digital effects were opening up all new possibilities. Movies like Terminator 2 and Independence Day were doing record-breaking business. The decade featured some of the darkest, most visually extravagant, and thematically daring studio science fiction in recent memory. The genre appeared to be moving into something like a new golden age, but it would turn out to be too short-lived for the stars my destination to earn a place in its roster.